Hello, welcome, good afternoon. My name is Simon, Professor Simon Morris and I'm the Director of Research for Art and Design at Leeds Beckett University. We are really thrilled to welcome John Thackerer, who in a moment will be formally introduced by Lauren Moriarty, our course director for BA Product Design. Just before I hand over to Lauren, a little information about this speaking series. The mission of the prestigious Inside Out lecture series is to bring the best minds of our generation to inspire and support the work students and staff do across Leeds School of Arts. To this end, we have brought you renowned speakers from around the globe. In order to enhance the cultural life of Leeds, we make the lecture series open to the general public and available to an international audience online. Um, we would welcome questions uh, at the end of this talk during the Q&A. So if you'd like to ask a question, please go to www.slido.com, that's S-L-I-D-O.com, and use the tag if you type in a password, it's capital I, capital O, dash, capital J for John, and it's J-O-H-N, capital T for Thakura, no space between John and Thakura, capital T for Thakura, T-H-A-C-K-A-R-A. I'll just do that one more time because I garbled it a bit. Um, so it's I O capitals dash capital J O H N capital T H A C K A R A. Now, please let me pass over to Lauren. Thank you. Thank you, Simon, and good afternoon, everybody. John Thackera is a philosopher, writer, and curator working in the realms of social ecological and relational design. John looks around the world for examples of what a sustainable world looks like and draws on a lifetime of travel in search of real world alternatives that work. He explores these examples through books, blogs and festivals. His latest book, How to Thrive in the Next Economy, Designing Tomorrow's World Today, has just been published in China and he's currently working on a project with Tongji University in Shanghai and frames this as an opportunity to do new things in new ways. So I'll hand over now to John Thackera. Thank you, Lauren, and it's fabulous to be here. Obviously, it'd be better if I was with you in person in some nice spring-like place. But just to say, I'm speaking to you from France in a small town called Garge in uh, the south of France, not far from Montpellier, if anybody knows this part of the world, where, like many of you, I've been pretty immobile for the last 18 months or so nearly. Um, but I'm speaking as somebody who, until this moment of COVID enforced um, immobility, I've been, as Lauren just said, looking around the world for examples of what a sustainable world not can be like, but is like now. So I'm not um, somebody who brings you utopias, concepts or dreams. I'm really somebody who says it's happening now. Um, the world that we think is beyond reach is actually already existing in different places, if only we should choose to look. Which is why, despite everything, that uh, all the reasons for being in despair, I'm still an optimist um, at heart. So it's in that spirit that I'm uh, very happy to do this talk today, which is, um, as Lauren said, a fresh kind of approach to this whole subject of what the sustainability word can mean, and especially how design can tr contribute to making it happen. So with that, I will um, go to my um, slides and we can start the, the formal procedure. And I'm guessing that hoping you can all see that. So this is the, the title of my talk is Alive, and I'll explain what that means, when social innovation meets living systems. So let's go straight to my uh, opening image, which is a possibly stark reminder that we're still in the latter phases and in some parts of the world right in the heat of this um, pandemic. And this image was taken from the Harvard Medical Review in the middle of last year, where is one of these many attempts to say, oh my God, what has hit us? And it described in that headline, 
emerging viral diseases and the journey from animals to humans. And the key part of my story today is that that's a slightly unfair to animals because I believe that uh, we're at a moment in the evolution of our society and our economy where we are to take responsibility for the things that hit us. And one of those is the, um, the origins of this virus. I've put there on the left um, a picture of the latest Mercedes electric vehicle, which was launched last week or so, um, because it's the pride and joy of the European technology, of design, of innovation, of tech, and it's at the centre of every speech and dream that our politicians and the innovators and the policy makers have about what the future holds. But I want to emphasize uh, at the beginning uh, that this dream and this um, self image of what successful innovation looks like is really a curse because it is intimately associated with the problems that we've had in the last period. And if you look on the right of the picture, the transmission cycle, I want to just begin by saying there are reasons why animals have been disrupted and sent into the world to um, share their viruses with us. And if we can keep a hold of that, it'll do us good in the long run. This image is from a rainforest um, provided to me, and I saw in a lecture by a professor called Alice Hughes, and I'll mention her again in a minute. It's what they call the herringbone pattern, which is visible all over the world whenever uh, resources of some kind are seen in a otherwise um, distant spot and the first road is built to get the prospectors with their trucks to come and start to explore and then very um, universally it's quite magical but weird these lateral roads are built for all the people who follow on behind um, with the supplying of the major industry whether it's a pipeline an oil plantation or increasingly something to do with mining for rare materials and that's the kind of key point, as you can probably guess, that I'm coming to, because every time that somebody um, designs a Mercedes electric vehicle or any of the smart products that are emblematic of Europe's self-image of the future, smart cities, Internet of Things, high computer products of one sort or another, at the moment of designing it, at the moment of making it the center of your policy, you trigger demand for the acquisition of those materials anywhere in the world and into the future. I mean, I was shocked, I must say, I read uh, two months ago, there was a report um, published by the European Commission called Action Plan on Critical Raw Materials as part of, and actually as a centerpiece of what they call the Green Deal. And as you could see there, the Mr. Sefcovic, the, uh, the commissioner responsible for the future of at the whole of industry in Europe, said Europe will need 60 times more lithium alone by 2050. Now, I don't know how much you know about lithium. It's crucial to batteries. It's crucial to a lot of electronics. It's already associated with absolutely awful uh, devastation in ecosystems and forests in different parts of the world. And that's just lithium. So the map shows you the European kind of map of where all these rare earth materials are going to come from to power the smart cities and the Mercedes EVs of the future. And if you just assume that the multiples of 10, 20, 50 or 100 times today's rates, you get a picture about the horrific scope of our, in, in, yes, our incursions into the natural world caused by this model of development. And there's Professor Hughes on the bottom right, who um, works for the Chinese Academy of Sciences on the subject of, um, amongst many things, bat cave conservation in tropical Asia. Um, and it was from her talk that I got that picture of the herringbone um, pattern in the forest. And her rather alarming um, explanation is that less, less than 10% of the roads and the developments in rainforests around the world appear in official reports. So every time you see a horrific story about mining or palm oil plantations, you can probably multiply by at least 10 what the reality is on the ground. And 
Lo and behold, every time somebody drives one of those roads through a rainforest in search of lithium or cobalt, then somewhere along the line, the habitats of creatures will be disturbed. And there, that's why the specification of a Mercedes and the disruption of the habitats of bats carrying viruses are part of one continuous story. And the picture on the right is the kind of global flows of one way or another of these materials. So right at this moment, we have to um, really stop making excuses for ourselves and just also look for alternatives, because if we carry on, there will for sure be a radical increase in the disruption of habitats from which viruses and things will come. And we have to make a choice. What is our spirit and philosophy going forwards? I'm very, very moved by this uh, statement by Luis Alberto Urea. There is no them, there is only us. And at the heart of what I want to share with you today is this proposition. Um, we need to stop thinking that resources and materials are somewhere else in the world in that we have to go and get them by whatever means possible. If we just stop thinking of us and them here and there, we will be in a much better place to proceed. But I want to do that in the knowledge that some of you watching are at this very moment completing your studies in design and you are smart, talented and ambitious people who want in one way or another to make things. So my kind of the challenge I've set myself today is, is it possible to reconcile the notion of being a designer of things with the reality, the inevitability, the certainty that when we specify and design a thing, the materials needed for that thing will have consequences somewhere else and some other not so distant future. In other words, can we have a design process in which there is no them, there is only us? What would that mean? And you can judge uh, in the next half an hour or so whether I've kept my promise to at least address that question seriously, because I'm very keen not to be somebody who you see wagging a finger and telling you not to be bad. I'm addressing the reality of what the design world is preoccupied with and that you need to know that there are alternatives that can be as meaningful and fulfilling for you and for your community as the ones that you're offered at the moment. So here's my first starting point is um, as a design um, action, looking around at possibilities, what are the problems, what are the questions? How do we design a thing or a service or a place in which our starting frame of mind is that we are doing this design action for all of life, not just human life? Um, and it's quite a big ask because the design world has spent the last you know, 20 years trying to get itself to be human centered and to think about users and to design things for everybody and not just for um, a small elite. I'm saying that's precisely half the way on the journey we need to be. The second half of the journey is designing for all of life, not just for human life. And that this notion of health and the health of the world is something which just crosses so many different dimensions. I'm flipping back a, here, a bit here to this notion of environmental um, disruption and the um, exposure of humans to um, pathogens. This is something which has become pretty kind of clear in a rather recent way that you can make a direct relationship between in disrupting a, a habitat and um, then the, the spread of disease. Therefore, and we know that because if you're a designer thinking about, well, I need to specify a chip or a battery for this product, somebody in the industrial world already knows where the lithium or the cobalt will come from. There is a direct in the supply chains of the world are wired up together in an extraordinary degree. And I've seen this happen. You can sit, somebody is staring at a, an iPad and says, oh, we'll need X kilos of lithium for this set of batteries for these products. They can press a button and it will then project into the rest of the world and through time where that lithium will be procured for. So it's all connected. But what makes it quite extraordinary, but actually rather marvelous, 
is that it's not just about bats and animals and trees and things that we can see. The parallel notion of designing for all of life is that 99% of the life around us is invisible. We can't see it even if we choose to look. This is uh, another scientist called Elizabeth Enough who has taken it upon herself to um, educate the world and herself about just how much life surrounds us, even in a rather mundane urban setting. Basically, 99% the microbes of the world is invisible. And she draws a comparison between the extraordinary attention we've all been placed to viruses and how to avoid viruses in the last period with the kind of language of uh, you know, scientific equipment and so on, with, on the other hand, the amount of life in the soil beneath our feet in a healthy garden, which most of us have never thought of or paid attention to. And this question, the health of the soil, is where I think the whole subject of designing for all of life really gets quite exciting, if exotic. I wanted to show you this as a video, but it was too difficult for me to work. But this is one of the ways in which science is blowing my mind, I don't know about yours, by representing the life in soil, this kind of stuff that we take for granted. Julian Lieber is a scientist in the United States who's found a way to uh, take videos of the mycorrhiza of plants as they go um, through the soil beneath us. You should, the, the green things have been added by him, but um, you should check it out on GitHub, and I'll come back to this a bit later. But the, the scientists are confirming that actually there's just gigantically far more life all around us than we ever realized before. So if we're designing for it and with it, the consequences are pretty dramatic. It's also, we can think of it on multiple scales, because in the same way that um, the, um, excuse me, if you can hear a dog echoing around Europe, um, in the same way that the, we need to pay attention to the soil, artists and philosophers are saying we need to stop thinking of the globe as some distant blue marble floating in the sky. And this is one of the extraordinary ways in which uh, designers and artists are trying to get us to think through the thicknesses of the Earth's crust, the atmosphere, um, the waters and the oceans. Um, this is for a project called Critical Zones, which is on at this moment in the Karlsruhe Media Center. It's just an example of so much rethinking in so many different disciplines and domains about um, what we're about. And so I want to kind of start my part two with this notion that um, although I gave you a scary story at the beginning about the viruses and the every design action triggers a extractive use of raw materials, that the alternative is all around us, not just in terms of um, economic activity, but in terms of ideas, of art, science and social practices, as well as design. And so the next bit of my talk is to give you a bit of a kind of quick review of all the different um, forms of alternative that people have been thinking about, even as these crises seemed to have enveloped us. And the key things to bear in mind is that millions of people in all walks of life want to put care before gross domestic product, before the money economy. It's not just a, a minority business. Many, many people think this is the only sensible and even sane way to proceed. And equally, that relationships in the economy that's emerging are much more important than transactions and paying for things. OK, that's kind of a couple of general points, but just as an example of the ferment of ideas, which maybe takes place away from the traditional territory of design. Here are some books by a German philosopher called Andreas Weber about the different ways in which life becomes more important than money in the world of ideas and ethics and knowledge. The book on the bottom left, Sharing Life, it's been an extraordinary impact in Germany, which, as you know, is an incredibly sophisticated, but also a self-consciously industrial power. Germany is where they, that electric Mercedes will come from. But Germany equally is in a ferment about whether um, 
designing large heavy electric cars is where the country should be going. Uh, these pub are published in English if anybody wants to check them out. There has been um, an extraordinary uh, rich outflowing of thinking from philosophers uh, to do with the notion of care as being the center of life and not something we should just regard as somebody else's responsibility. Two of the key books in this are Donna Haraway's book, Staying with the Trouble from five years ago, and Matters of Care on the right, um, more about the speculative ethics of making things. How, what gives us the right to make things if we know, as I've just told you, that the consequence will be some sort of disruption somewhere else? Here's a, a 60 page book, which I warmly recommend from again five years ago, um, reimagining value. What is valuable in the world? And what should we be designing? What is a valuable thing to be designing? And this is a very succinct and simple guide to the notion of what happens to, in an economy where care is more important than money and where the nature is given the framework of that which we refer to. And it's just one of these kind of background stories that um, is shaping the rest of the story. And here is something I confess I learned about last week. It's such a great name, hydrofeminism, um, which I learned about at a European webinar about the Bauhaus of the seas, but I'm not going to go into the details about it. But the background image is one of the other unknown stories of our world, the plankton of a healthy ocean which we neglect pretty much the same degree as we neglect the microbes in healthy soil. And the promise of the notion of hydrofeminism is if we care about life more than we care about money, then we will pay attention to and start to take serious account of the life that surrounds us. So this is by way of saying, this is what the philosophers have been figuring out during the kind of chaos and the mayhem of the mainstream uh, politics and media. But to finish my quick run through some books, the, I personally was convinced that something amazing was happening in the last three months by two things. The first was the publication of this book, um, which is called Multi-Species Cities. It's published in um, Japan, or based in Japan. It's, it's a kind of global authors. It's a solar punk book, which is um, kind of a science fiction. But when you read the stories in this book, it's very similar to the things you would see in many architecture schools and for sure in those philosophy books I was just telling you about. And so what in when I was young, science fiction was about exotic, distant and unlikely futures. Whereas now it's like reading a newspaper about what's happening now, not so far away. Great stuff and very readable, by the way, if you want to get that book. And then two days ago, I saw this story on the front page of the Financial Times um, living section. To my astonishment, they made this the main story. It's a piece from the Venice Biennale, which Superflux, a design and art studio, have done this very elaborate and very beautiful um, creation of a multi-species dinner party. Now, you can make of that what you will. My argument is that what on earth is the Financial Times doing and why putting this story and this otherwise crazy concept on its front pages? Because it's in the air. Everybody is looking around and saying we can't go on like this. And if we can't go on like this, how can we go on? So I'm not suggesting that the Financial Times is going to get people to invest in multi-species things. But it's, it, I'm t I am telling you that it's um, cropping up everywhere. So that's, if you like, is the philosophy and the kind of ideas part of this unfolding future. I mentioned at the beginning that social practices are also part of the alternative worlds that are emerging in lots of places that we might not know so much about. I was um, involved five years ago in some meetings about the foundation of the ecological restoration camps, and then I didn't pay so much attention because um, they went off to different parts of the world to start doing it. 
No, it's a, just a phenomenal worldwide phenomenon. The people are volunteering their time to go to hot, dusty and damaged landscapes and put in the work together with you know, the local farmers, to scientists, ecologists, scientists of one sort or another, physically restoring ecosystems by planting and digging and repairing the land. It's hard work, it's not paid, but it's caused an extraordinary kind of amount of social enthusiasm and creativity by people who want to do something rather than just perpetually talk about it. Um, I mentioned uh, that book about multi-species urbanism. Through them, I heard about the boom in Japan of people rehabilitating canals and waterways all over their cities, not by turning them into exotic riverfront leisure destinations, but into turning them into, into green and fertile gardens. And so all over the place, people are finding ways to grow food and make productive and nourishing in a physical sense places that were damaged waterways and the world is filled with damaged waterways. The beauty of this story is that it's not a civic project I mean, the, the city supports them, but it's volunteer work, people gardening for pleasure and for social duty and for solidarity. You can check um, the Feast project is monitoring some of that work around certainly in Asia. Then uh, other ways of restoring watersheds are cropping up all over the world. We keep seeing horror stories about, you know, poisoned rivers and the like. This is in Bangalore, where some good friends of mine um, are part of a movement to restore lakes and rivers um, in ways that um, involve a lot of combinations between volunteer work and professionals. The pro-am movement is very powerful in that part of the world and in other parts of India and East Asia too. It's extraordinary just how many people, they don't just sample the water in order to go and complain, and then become citizen experts looking for ways to help whoever owns the, the land, the, the citizens who live near there, the farmers, the industries, collaborative efforts to clean up their waterways, not waiting for some external body to do it. It gets more exotic when the artists get involved in looking for other ways to measure the health of the waters and the soil. Ecoacoustics is a remarkably um, widespread activity, which I didn't know so much about a couple of years ago. Um, Joe Brzezinska has found a way to sample the sound of soils in different contexts, and she can beginning to understand that the the intensity of the noise of worms moving around or insects burrowing will be one of the many uh, indicators of healthy soil or soil that is less healthy. And ecoacoustics is a very powerful way of uh, quite low cost way to find out about the health of land that is not able to be gamed by greenwashing corporate uh, bad guys who might say, of course, we're meeting all our requirements with ecoacoustic data, you can find out for real how healthy is that land. And not just in a um, rural context. Um, this is um, in Boston, where people have realized that compost heaps are a source of um, incredible vitality in terms of the microbial health of a city. But compost heaps don't, you can't just, well you can, but you should not just leave them there, they need to be looked after. So this being MIT territory, they've made open source compost sensors so they can determine how the, heat, how the heat is doing and when the compost heap needs turning or tending to, a signal will be sent to somebody to come and do their labor. Uh, many, many thousands of projects um, are emerging in which school students of all ages and subjects learn how to monitor different factors of environmental health and performance using low cost technology, but the technology captures the data, but it does not um, interpret it and it does not take action when the data signals some kind of problem. So that's the beauty of this kind of monitoring is that people are able to um, learn how to use equipment, but um, then are then enabled to connect others with other skills to take remedial action. 
This is um, a rather well-known project for monitoring uh, illicit or illegal activity in a rainforest using very low cost devices that can detect movement or sound. And again, it's kind of cool technology to monitor a forest, but the crucial bit is to use the data or the information to mobilize people to come and do something if some kind of problem is detected. This is another great project from, this is from Barcelona, where along with many European cities, they have a problem of air pollution, which is denied or otherwise ignored by whoever the authorities are. By making testing and monitoring equipment cheap and open source and easily um, distributed, as in the Smart Citizen project, you can then uh, mobilize citizens and give them data of a high technical quality to go to the people who would otherwise be able to ignore it. This is another favorite one you may have read. Well, if you're, in, if you're interested in environmental questions, you will know that peat is a crucial feature of a healthy landscape. Peat is also a product that is sold for burning or for growing plants in. And there's a global fight between the peat extracting industry and the peat um, protecting industry. This is from the second group. Um, how do you monitor and track the health of a peat landscape? It's a big story, and I just like the kit to show you that something primordial like peat, which can be very old, with some high-tech, pretty sort of lashed together and hacked equipment, can connect the green and the tech and the environmental narrative together. And here's a great one. One of my favorites is the tea bag index. So if you want to monitor the health of soil, you can, there's all sorts of things you can do, but the one of the, the just, I think it's some Danish students came up with the idea of burying tea bags in soil and the degree to which the tea bags evolve and change is an indicator of soil health, costing basically nothing, has the two benefits of giving you low cost uh, soil health monitoring and gets you out uh, digging holes to put the tea bags in and therefore it's a health it's a, um, site specific form of testing. You can check it out. They're doing it all over the world. There are people burying tea bags to test the, the, uh, the health of their soil. It's extraordinary, uh, which I didn't know about until I found out this, um, um, yeah, this website you can find out for yourselves. But I mentioned that, you know, social practices and social innovation is part of this story. And I, I do emphasize that um, I mentioned some tech here, but the crucial question for me is that technology is low cost and often very low bandwidth, but it's been mobilized in a social context. And that if, for example, you decide as a designer, you'd like to maybe get involved in one of these projects, there are now emerging some extraordinarily interesting ways to track down and identify the project that might be interesting to you. So this is um, from Poland. Um, uh, Maria Davidova has made this extraordinary kind of interactive map, not of you know the, the physical space, not of the economic, and not of the normal buildings of, um, that you would find in any city, but of the ecological and social experiments that are happening in that part of the town. And that is a kind of interactive map. You can click on if it says compost toilet or, uh, you know, um, a tool house or a, a rainwater collection project. You can find out where they are and who's doing it. And then you can figure out whether they could use some help from a designer in uh, improving the project. It, I, it's basically this picture represents the big subject of there's a lot of it happening. You as a designer do not need to invent many of these practices, but there are hundreds, thousands, probably millions of grassroots projects that are doing their thing for the most part below the radar, but they could all in one way or another do their job better if they had some high quality design help to do it. And so I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'm not going to make it easy for you to say, do this, make it hard for you. Just to say that if you're keen to get involved, there are lots of ways to find out where to start. Um, but I do 
accept the times are tough and you're coming for those of you who are students or professionals um, it's not really a viable option to volunteer 100 percent of your time uh, for repairing nature and restoring the ecosystems that have been damaged by the search for rare materials and everything else so the, this part of my talk is about the more formal part of the economy which is to do with um, ecological restoration but which again is pretty low profile and for some reason which i'm not 100 percent clear about receives very little attention um, but the rosé restoration economy exists it's quite enormous and it contains again many design opportunities so there's a, there's a there's a website which i have slightly mixed feelings about its name called eco marketplace which tracks the amount of money being spent by governments by cities by regions all over the so-called advanced world on ecological restoration if you go there you can see they've got dozens of surveys but one of the things that they concluded this year from looking at the u.s market of all places is that and i quote ecological restoration is already larger than mining logging or steel production that's today before the kind of green new deal has actually kicked in before this spending on green infrastructure has started and there are different ways of you know looking at what this might mean but all those activities you see in the in the in the picture are being done in one way or another in different places not always perfectly well not always well funded maybe not in a definitely you know, lots of things that could be improved the point is that green infrastructure is a known feature for tens of thousands of municipalities just in europe it's not something you have to explain but they are things that can all be without exception improved by the bit of design expertise. There's an umbrella term for this subject called civic ecology or ecological urbanism, which is a kind of a list of all the places in any city that could be made healthier with some care and attention and probably some design, some science and so on. You can see that list there. There's a booklet being published in Norway called Cities of Nature. There are many, many uh, websites and platforms and networks doing this work now. I wanted to, in the picture on the right, credit one of the pioneers, Marina Alberti, an American professor who wrote that book seven or eight years ago about advances in urban ecology before the subject became fashionable. Uh, the point being that for seven or eight years is a a very short time in normal course of events but it's incredible how fast this subject has emerged as a serious concern for cities and governments in that period in other words you don't have to go out and advocate for nature in the cities every city is thinking about it they just don't all have a shared understanding of where they start and who's going to do it and who's going to pay for it one of the hot subjects which is fairly widespread is this concept of river daylighting. Um, this is a project I learned about in Saint-Étienne in France 10 years ago, where they discovered that there's a the river Furon runs right underneath the city and during the industrial age it was buried in concrete. And what's quite fascinating here is that the um, expectation is not that it's a massive civil engineering project, but that it's a social project a social innovation project as much as an engineering one because there are so many people doing projects of a social and ecological nature not where it's buried in the city center but nearby which you can see on the left in other words there are you know hundreds of citizen groups doing things on a small scale that can be connected to each other and whose activities can for sure be helped by some designers who know about equipment or services or whatever Dam removal is a, I've always loved the subject of dam removal because so many people have told me, fishermen and so on, that dams have done terrible damage to the ecosystems and watersheds of Europe. The one on the top is one of many dams in Scotland that is actually scheduled to be removed. And there's a, uh, but the, what I didn't understand is the sheer enormous scale 
of hydraulic obstacles that need to be dealt with. And then some people have project called Let It Flow. It's another citizen science project for tracking the location of obstacles all over Europe, which could potentially be removed to then bring back the free flowing health of the water. Um, you can't, to my great disappointment, just blow up a dam. It's quite a complicated business, as you, it's a bit of thought. It requires all sorts of planning and consultations with people and so on. But there's a lot of work that um, is being unleashed by the dam removal boom, except it's not a proper boom, but it's a kind of, you know, an economic boom. But if you remember uh, when I said at the beginning that designing for life and means embracing the 95% of life that's invisible so that as well as rivers and forests and biodiversity corridors and meadows, there's an imminent um, um, extraordinary change of focus in the notion of green infrastructure implied, in, uh, inspired by the microbiome. There's a, a scientist called Jake Robinson, who's the one of the pioneers of something called microbiome inspired green infrastructure or MIGI, who is exploring different ways in which beneficial bacteria can be given habitats in and around the city. Uh, it's a very um, new but quite dramatic um, form of um, research and some of the kind of applications are understandable. You know, you can get a concrete panel which will be made um, receptive to fungi or to moss or to lichen called bioreceptive materials. But there's lots of other techniques being used to show how do you not just plant trees everywhere in a kind of random way, but select plants from the biggest tree to the tiniest moss and have them um, scattered around in a very kind of mindful way with scientific and design advice so that you can have a healthy environment more than an unhealthy one. This crosses over into the rather vast world of biophilic design or biomimicry, and I'm not going to go that road too much today. Um, but just to say that I'm a personally I'm a big fan of lichen and mosses because they're so beautiful when you look at them. And as soon as you discover a subject that you think, now somebody should find out about mosses and buildings, of course, somebody is already doing that. So there's a whole network of people in the bryophyte. Bryophyte is a scientific word for, word for lichen. Surveying the different forms of lichen that can be found on you know, hard surfaces and which ones might be suitable for a health adding um, surface in an urban context. It's a big subject um, and a very exciting one. And I'm, I'm trying to persuade Jake that uh, this project in China, uh, which I'm basically pushing, I don't want to suggest that it's all up and running, but my basic um, ambition for the near future is that we can find a way to make the Tonji University campus a test site on a rather large scale for this kind of MIGI approach. Uh, it, it's a fairly, like many university campuses, there's lots of green there at the moment, but I know in talking to the managers of this vast piece of urban real estate that um, it's a kind of maintenance it goes to the maintenance department not to the health department and so my uh, proposition to them is that and professor Lowe, who's my boss that if they want to have a healthy university and a healthy campus we need to start um, thinking of the campus as a kind of health layer of mosses and lichen and trees and plants not just as something to be maintained and there is actually a concept called um, a bryophyte pathway, which you see on the right, in which carefully select selected um, plants, uh, when they are kind of grown together and looked after, can be very beneficial to, for example, nursing mothers. It's a big subject, um, but the main thing is that until you do it in practice, you don't learn very much about uh, what can be done and what can't be done. So watch this space on the, uh, the butty right uh, filled Tonji campus. Um, but I thought I would come back in the last sort of 10 minutes or so to this business of, you know, I'm talking about rather radical departures from normal design practice. 
and those pictures I showed you of designers standing in their studios and in exhibitions with prototypes, I haven't forgotten you, uh, but I also haven't forgotten that designers have an incredible contribution to make in terms of the um, emerging huge networks of people who want to do something practical about the soil. So this book on the left is, I think that's four or five years ago, one of the first books in which practitioners uh, from the world of ecology as well as from ethics or philosophy said, what actually needs to be done for society and the members of it to look after soil properly? And when that book was published, people said, What's, we, do we need more books or do we need to get some people together to practice it? And so the Soil Care Network was founded in four years ago. Um, and it's international practitioners of soil science, of civic design, of um, botany, of all sorts of things, in which the most crucial thing is that it's not just regarded as a technical question. There are two parallel missions here. One is to persuade the world to pay attention to the soil and its biological diversity, and the other is to then do something about it. And this is a fundamental change from the history of the environmental movement, which sad to say, and I'm part of it in relatively late comer, has involved a lot of finger wagging and telling everybody how cool they are to the planet, but rather smaller amount of practical initiatives. So the Soil Care Network is the next generation um, let's do something and not just talk about it um, phenomenon. And if you I check out their, their sites and they've got a brilliant newsletter, you can see the extraordinary range of things that is happening. But what has been learned by this determination, not just to kind of advocate, not just to be an activist, not just to be a scientist, not just to be a scared policymaker, not just to be a scared business leader, supposing that everybody agrees that it's a shared responsibility to do something rather than just talk about it, what kind of combination of activities does that involve? So what I've learned is that, and I spent a long time trying to say, well, are the scientists the best people to do this? Maybe artists should be in charge, or maybe we need social innovation. We need all of these activities to work together um, in order to make the soil healthier and all that follows from that. So science has an incredible role to play in understanding the soil, in measuring its health or otherwise, and in reassuring people like policymakers or politicians that this work is valuable. Art, on the other hand, has, I think, possibly a more important role to play in getting us people to pay attention to soil in the first place. And then, having started to pay attention, to get kind of entangled and preoccupied and enchanted. These are the words from those books I showed you earlier. Artists can get us to kind of hooked on the subject and make us dissatisfied just to talk about it. Social practices, as I mentioned, are pretty crucial as accompanying those. If we want to act as civic scientists or just having our street being healthy, if we want to collaborate, and in particular, if we want to belong to this movement, that's where social practices add an incredible quality. And design, I think we're going to be part of it. We can design equipment and services, of course, but design can also be one of the forms of expertise and the platforms to help all these different things work together. And I'll come back to that a bit more at the end in a couple of minutes. Um, but basically what I'm describing in soil care is a convergence of all we've achieved in the technical world, that is to say the internet, and all that we're learning now about the natural world, it's the nature's internet, the mycorrhizae and the filaments, beginning to say these are not two stories, they are one story, but that we need to rethink our role in terms of what we are trying to achieve is not filling the world full of tech, on the contrary, what we're trying to achieve is to fill the world full of healthy plants and land. So we can do that by observing. This is one of the things that science can do. Simon Sublime, a very wonderful scientist, who then 
finds ways of showing you the amount of life in a soil. Another scientist, I told you, I showed you this earlier, Julian Lieber's mind boggling images of life um, filaments that we just didn't know were there until very recently. Lieber has done this also incredible work opening our minds through scientific observation to the amount of activity in what I personally thought was a forest covered in dead leaves, which I think most of us would recognize. He has found ways using DNA profiling and sampling to make a very detailed picture of the life and the nutritional kind of communities that live um, under the floor of this sea of dead leaves. There are scientists who can measure the greenness of the leaves in a forest and tell us how healthy the forest is as a result. Um, it's called phenology, mind boggling what they can do. Um, and it goes on. So the scientific and technical world has an incredible um, array of tools at our disposal. Once we get hooked on the fact that the healthy soil and the healthy life is our task in life. So it's not that we have to then retreat into some kind of um, tent in the forest and starve. There are lots of tools at our disposal, but the tools are only useful if we can animate people to find uses for them. And this is where the social creativity and the design of the arts come in. There's a huge range of stuff happening about soil being more than we thought it was. I'm just going to touch on a couple here. So this is terramation, which is turning our bodies into healthy soils so it can be spread around a garden, which is a kind of combination of technology. It's quite a cool technology just to physically do it, but also the social creativity to make it an acceptable thing to do rather than being burned in an or buried in the, in the ground. So there's a social innovation of terramation being socially acceptable. And then on the right, um, another one of these wonderful um, unsung uh, creative individuals, Marcus Bernley, who works out of Hong Kong. How do we find ways to connect our bodily processes to the processes of enriching the soil? I'm not going to go into details on his story. You should check him out. But um, just suffice it to say that he takes fermentation, composting and bodily fluids into directions that I personally hadn't thought of before, but does so in a way that makes this kind of metabolic story socially and culturally engaging as well as scientifically so. Here's an example of science, design and art combining. This was in an island in Sweden. This was, I think, when my mind was first blown by the subject of soil as something that was more than I thought. It's called a soil tasting ceremony and you can look it up um, but basically what it means is you can you, you get plants from different parts of the forest you make a tisane a little tea out of the plant you dig up some soil from where the plant grows and then you taste the tisane and taste the soil and start to sensory embodied way experience the difference in the soil where the plant was growing it's a very very magical moment. Ramya Maze on the left there is now a very eminent professor, but she was the one that uh, brought me and these guys together on an island in Sweden and said, really, design is not just about um, making things and uh, making stories and communicating. Design is about reconnecting with subjects and places and qualities we have neglected. So I owe a lot to her for that insight and her genius as a teacher in helping us to do bizarre things like soil tasting, which I now regard as a necessary normal practice. And then another final example about um, this extraordinary convergence between technology, design and art. So on the left, this is, I'm running a bit late, so I'm not going to go on for much longer, but on the left is um, Fishcoin Network have figured out a way to do the DNA fingerprinting of an individual fish and turn that DNA profile into a piece of electronic information that can be shared on the blockchain. And you have the, the elements, the beginnings of a 
reliable way to trace the journey of fish from one part of the world to another in an industry which is, as you know, horrendously filled with criminality and lying and greenwashing. Uh, just the salmon in Scotland by itself is a kind of pretty much a ghastly scandal. But the point being, this is a technological business solution that is kind of coming to fruition thanks to the incredible attention being given to it. But to me, a technical solution is only half the story. Until we really start to think about fish as living creatures to whom we owe respect and to whom we owe a duty of care, even if we eat them, until we have the technical side and the moral and the cultural side, we will not make the progress we need. And that's why the picture on the right is stuck so strongly in my mind. It was on a, another island in the near uh, Sweden and Denmark called Bornholm, way back in 2004, in which two artists, really not under anybody's direction, we were investigating what could the future of the fishing industry be in that island. And they just thought the word industry and the kind of horrendous clunky equipment that we were shown by the head of the economic department, they just felt upset by this and wanted to have a different approach. So over a period of a week, they enacted a kind of funeral procession for an individual fish, which ended up with them accosting members of the public in the streets of Bonholm with beautiful caskets containing one fish. And it, you can read about it. It's a just, it basically confronts people with the thought that this is a fish, has a, a life and a history. It is not just a piece of protein, as the industry would call it. And they just, well, that struck with me ever since, all that time. And I think that the artist's capacity to evoke our moral and ethical and cultural responsibilities and the scientists and the designers way to measure stuff, they're not alternatives. We need to do them both together. And I had this just this morning, I think, maybe we should call it the nature attention economy as the this alternative rather than just a restoration economy sounds a bit technical. But what I've learned from the artists and the writers over these years is this business that has frustrated the environmental movement in which we had too many people, me not excluded, standing up and telling people what to do. Consume less, stop killing the planet, be nice to Mother Earth. People said, don't just tell me things, show me what you mean. Then we started to kind of make pictures and films and, uh, you know, to have sort of visual and sort of evocative images of the story, but they were still just images. And so the, the cry changed, don't just show me, connect me, connect me to this thing, connect me to this place. So that was a second phase. And then it turned into something more. It said, don't just connect me, don't just show me that I'm related to this field or this ocean or this farm. I want to be enchanted. I want to feel magical about it, not just, not just a scientific kind of cold, rational thing. And then don't just enchant me, but entangle me. I'm summarizing you know, many, many years of very important philosophical work here, but I just have to excuse my boundarization. The basic direction that we've gone in, where the philosophers and the artists and the designers and the scientists, I think, can meet are if we can be entangled in the web of life, if we can think of it not as something we observe from outside, but something that we're part of, if we can be kind of persuaded through different forms of experience that not only that we're alive, that we belong within it, that changes the whole nature of what we do as designers, as artists, as designers, as engineers. And for those of you who don't know this book, it's called Playing for Time. It's a very wonderful anthology of different ways in which artists have entangled people, connected them, enchanted them, two aspects of the world around them in ways that seemed impossible till the artist came along. So to conclude, two pictures of um, how designers can operate at the kind of level of organizing things. I've, I've gone a bit over my time, so I'll just show you these two things that care networks, the different sorts of people that need to be involved in looking after a forest, a field or a river, lots of different people need to be involved. That is both social infrastructure, you know, an organizational question, but it's also about keeping the spirit alive. So you need 
this human nature entanglement to animate our work. And it's something which the <clears throat> scientists, as you can see on the right, it's the relationships and the intensity of the relationships and how durable they are that determine the health of a system. And that this is something people are beginning to design. So Hugh Doubly, a very eminent and very wonderful American designer, has been evolving a platform for nature care um, in which we use the language and the technology of membership platforms or sales platforms or the Internet of Things, but repurposed to be the infrastructure that connects us um, around the spaces that we want to thrive. Um, I just leave that. You can see that um, on the recording or I can make the slides available. But the point is, this is something which exists, membership platforms, but they're for other things. Why not have a membership platform for that tree? And we can all look after the tree in the different ways that we want to do. I think that's, I'm sorry, I've got a couple of minutes over my allotted time. Uh, Life Worlds is the project I'm developing with Tonji and Lo Yang Chi. And then thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Thank John. You, John. That was absolutely fascinating um, and just brought to life with so many examples, I think, um, of what different people are doing. Uh, I've certainly learned a lot today. There's things that I hadn't I've never heard of before. And we have lots of questions here um, and almost to the point where I'm not quite sure where to start. Um, so we'll go through. I think one question actually um, was about making slides available um, and the, this is being recorded. It will be shared um, after the event as well. So you'll be able to go back uh, and look at, at that again. So I think we could start actually um, on the subject of care and getting change to happen and what causes an individual to change their behaviour. Um, you know, you sort of mentioned about you're not interested in pointing a finger at somebody and saying they're doing something wrong. Um, so this idea of maybe the more socially and culturally engaging way forward. Yes, I mean, I have done my share of finger pointing, as I said, and I don't have a lifetime history of environmental practice. But I can all I can do is to point at the moments that have most affected and changed me and also talking to many people and saying well if what when when did you change when did you actually get it or when did you decide that you were not um, immobilized and it was nine times out of ten it was people had some kind of embodied experience in a place with other people in which some small action happened that made things a bit better that was when they realized that they were not helpless and they were not powerless and so the size of the project is not important. It's in fact, it's been really almost the opposite that small things can make a big difference when those small things enable somebody to kind of take the first step on a longer journey. You know, I, the, I've met people, you know, working to restore a stream in the southwest of England where they every weekend they go and stand up to their sort of neck or well, to their legs in muddy water, cleaning bits of rivulets and they go and tramp up the hill and talk to a farmer and say, would you mind stopping your cow from peeing into the stream? Or they go and talk to somebody and say, would you please not wash your car here? It's poisoning the water. But they have this sort of social duties of, you know, educating each other and the people and physically with their hands uh, cleaning up the stream. And then they have this thing, you know, very, very professional um, organization that orchestrates their work so it's properly organized. But you have this combination of, you know, somebody organizing it well, doing something with your hands, doing something with other people. Those, I think, are the recipes for <laughs> positive change. Great, thank you. Great, thank you. And so this idea of, of local initiatives, because quite a lot of the things were site specific, but you could see how they could connect to a bigger thing. Um, how does that work in the context of global challenges we face? Should things be scalable? Is it OK that they're small things, that they're local things? 
It's a great question, Lauren, and uh, I'm very sympathetic that, to people who say this is too small to make a difference. But I do think that I have two answers. One is that it's one of the failures of the positive change agents that they over dramatize or they just tell us terrifying stories about the sheer the climate crisis, the collapse of biodiversity around the world. These global things, they almost describe hopelessness and the, the very language they use and the scale is hopeless. But the point is that we've learned from scientists as well as from other forms of wise people that big systems that contain lots of small agents, however tiny, and I've tried a bit today to say that microbes are part of the systems as much as human beings or companies or ecosystems, we're all connected in ways that we very, very barely understand. So if we start with the notion that we're connected somehow in ways that maybe are unknowable, then every action will have an effect. Therefore, taking a tiny action may only have a tiny effect, but we don't know for sure that it won't have accumulated the um, a very positive one. And so it's about being mindful in taking small actions in a way that you kind of be, you're alert to the consequences. I think that that's, I would say that it's, it's a practice, it's an art as much as a science, and I'm totally not a, uh, very advanced in that. But my kind of take on it is that we need to give people the opportunity for making a small difference so that they can then learn by doing and then we can all do that together and learn from each other. Great, thank you. Um, we have lots of questions coming in on the chat. So um, we have, um, do you see a conflict between um, the educational bubbles in which we teach art and design subjects and the need for collaboration to foster eco-social innovation? <clears throat> I think conflict is the wrong word. I think that um, the bubbles that we all live in I'm in a writer curator bubble and you're in a design teacher designer bubble, I guess. Um, bubbles are not per se evil things. So long, I mean, if you look at the picture that I ended up, you know, the plankton go around the seas of the vast oceans in a bubble of protoplasm. and But they meet each other and they kind of connect from various moments to propagate or to whatever they all do, eat each other. Um, it's to do with being mindful and um, determined to look for connections as a basic, um, a basic kind of culture belief that I said that I use this word relational quite a lot. Uh, but in practice, you know, if you're on your own, then you're possibly more likely to be feel isolated and powerless than if you're in relationship with people and with a place. So from the point of view of design education, Yes, of course, design schools and architecture schools and business schools are bubbles in their own way. Of course they are. But um, it's also, and it requires a positive action to reach out and connect with something outside the bubble. But all I would say is, and I've been doing this you know, for quite a long time now, as soon as you get out of your little bubble to meet a geographer or a farmer or uh, somebody caring for an old person, you learn so much so quickly not just in terms of practical information, but also about positive energy, that it's just, it feeds on itself. It's the first step outside your bubble that often seems to be the hardest to take. And um, that's why I don't, you know, I don't, it is difficult and, and design schools are busy and pressured and goodness knows what kind of requirements they're having to meet. But if you think of relationships as the fundamental sort of sign of being healthy, then that helps to order your priorities. Great, thank you. Um, and you were talking a bit earlier about different sensors. We have a question about what sensor would you be longing for that to date does not exist? <laughs> <laughs> uh, <clears throat> well, firstly, I think that whatever I can think of, it probably does exist. It's pretty mind boggling, the, the sensor world out there. Um, I think I would quite like a sensor to tell me more about the drops of water I see on plants when I'm out walking with my dogs. Because one of the things that I just do not understand, and I probably was very bad at science since a thousand years ago, the amount of water sitting on plants early in the morning is to me a miracle. 
I'm not sure why I need to know this, but I would like to be able to point something at it and say there's so much water on that plant and <laughs> look at them. And, uh, I don't know, whatever. I, I used to think that I would like a sensor to tell me about what sort of plant am I looking at or how healthy is that soil, but that's all existing. It's all been, uh, somebody has designed all these things. And I think we just have to be, it's totally about being explorers rather than being inventors. That's a, one of the ways to think about it. But if you want to, to sense, you want to know something about any subject, what did I learn last week? There are whole thousands of scientists who study the surface of leaves in plants. And once you go in close, the surface of leaves are like whole ecosystems, universes of life and activity that are invisible to the naked eye. And they use all sorts of different um, techniques to do that. And so, yeah, um, go and find it if you need it is one a short answer. Yeah, um, I've heard it before, you know, that designers, um, to be a designer is sort of to be a discoverer. You know, it's about going out and discovering. Um, so, yeah, um, we've got another question, which is we've got lots. Oh, it's all jumping around on my screen. Um, so how can we learn from countries who would be considered less economically developed, but really they just live with a consideration to nature? A great question, a very big one, actually. And um, <clears throat> one again, which is five years ago, not more than that, it was regarded as exotic and sentimental to look for, quote, undeveloped countries for indigenous knowledge. Now it's becoming pretty mainstream simply because the evidence is piling up for those who need evidence that people who've lived in places on the land, with the land, with living systems, tend to know far more about it than those of us who live in offices and look at screens and sensors. And so it's not like an alternative between the knowledge of a, an indigenous person and the knowledge of a scientist. It's about having both. It's something I thought about putting in my talk today, but it was already too much. Um, <laughs> It, but I, yeah, there were so, just an example. So during the last very trying period of COVID, we've had a lot of attention paid to solidarity um, arrangements. We need, you know, food banks or looking for people who are isolated in their home, whatever. I just know probably a tiny bit that cultures all over the world have very elaborate systems of solidarity in place that have evolved over very long periods of time without which they wouldn't have survived and often prospered and which we know nothing about and that we therefore can learn a lot from that. I mean, I'll just give you an example. The small town where I live in France, we have a quite a big um, North African Arab community of different cultures. And every now and again, I think, well, how, do, how what's it like for them to try and get support from the state when things are really bad, like they are now during COVID? And one of my neighbours said, what are you talking about? We, of course, nobody starves in our community. We have, we know when people need help, we have ways of giving them help. They, we look after each other. We get each other food. We look after them when they need resources. It's just that we don't do that through your mainstream system. And that's just true everywhere. There is incredible naivete that we should imagine that uh, we kind of have to come to go and help people. I mean, frankly, I think we're the ones that need help because um, if we're now entering a period of living with more modest means, poor people have had much more practice than we have. So we need to kind of be a bit more humble in figuring out how to get by on less and to realize that people can be very positive and have very creative and joyful lives with less material throughput than we do. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, and we you were sort of talking earlier um, about science meets art, meets design, meets policy and, and politics, all of those things um, coming together. And we've got a question um, that just starts with thank you, you know, wonderful talk. And how can we make these practices across sci, art, design, social practices more visible at local and global levels? Well, I, sh I'm, I, uh, it's taken me 20 years to understand my own question, which is similar to that one. How can we make, <clears throat> I knew and thought it sounded very cool and very obvious. Of course, science and art should collaborate together. 
What I have discovered is that the only time this statement makes sense is when you see it done in practice. So there's no theory of it or method deck or kind of, you can't go on a course about it, well, maybe. But what the magical moments that I have seen is when artists and scientists have shared an interest and a passion about a subject or a place and have in some way or another just collaborated to bring that story to life or change some aspect of it. I mean, those women in, in Bondholm, they were artists. We were surrounded by kind of economists and policy makers and designers talking about new industries and new jobs and new kind of things that could be done on the island. But they were the ones who said, well, look, this island was b built on fish, but it's become a kind of horror story in terms of brutalizing and industrializing its own livelihood. What would it mean to sensitize ourselves on this island to when we respected the fish and when we respected the sea? And that is an artistic kind of practice that nobody else thought about. But that took so much pressure off everybody else, because as soon as we started to think about having a healthy relationship to the sea and a healthy relationship to fish, a thousand other opportunities occurred to us. But before that, we were kind of going through the motions of mainstream innovation, mainstream design. You need them both. But I'm not aware of any kind of, I don't know how, that, it's just those two women were brilliant and they just did it. So I don't know quite how, they were, in, they were in our group. That's the thing. You could curate the group and then you sometimes hope that magic happens. Yeah, that's the lovely concept, isn't it, of magic happening um, when these thing, different things come together as well. Um, what other questions have we got? We have got, how do we make the best and cheapest way uh, to do things the most socially conscious and caring way? So well, cheapest one way, and most. Well, I think one way is to have no money, which I think we're all going to experience that if we haven't already. So if you have no money and the money is drying up, from whatever the sources used to be, one very quickly becomes creative or not. I mean, um, I, that, yeah, my world, I, you know, in days gone by, I would be in a big organization with budgets and government to give me money every year. I haven't had that for 20 years, but I don't think I was nearly as creative then as I am now. But I tell you, the main thing is to go and find other creative people to work with. It's not so complicated. So if you say, okay, we only got $100 for this meal, for, for our community, you just go and find people who are known to be creative with making food out of nothing and get them to be part of your project. And uh, lots of people live like that every day. So it's to do with finding the positive energy and the skills that are all around and just um, connecting with them by whatever means possible, which is why a lot of what I'm describing is like as much curating, curating as creating, it's curating, you know, connections, getting the right people together and helping them to do their thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then we have a comment, which is, um, it's great to hear about how connected everything is. Design equals health. So that, that was, yeah, a nice comment as well. And then we have um, another question, which is, um, what do you think about trendy biophilic design and biophilic cities? Ah, well, that's a possibly a loaded question. <laughs> I, um, there's, it's, it's a huge uh, buzzword. I don't know if you've heard of a company called, uh, what's it called, Ginkgo Bioworks. <clears throat> it's in Boston. Again, it's the latest biotech company. It's just done an IPO and they, everybody thinks it's going to be as valuable as Facebook in the future. To answer your question, I think that it's a mistake to believe that the purpose in life is to make things. And that the whole biophilic design, biomimicry, bio this and bio that, it's filled with very brilliant and creative people. But what turns them on is making things. And I just think that is the sort of the wrong way to be enthusiastic. I understand it applies to a lot of designers, but I have to answer your question. I think the question is, what can I do that to make this place healthier? the place being where I live, where microbes live, where trees live, what activities and relationships will make it healthier? And that's my question. And then after that, you then maybe end up making things, but it's not that you start off by saying, how can I make things out of plants rather than plastic, which millions of, well, a lot of people are doing. 
because that presupposes that the world needs us to make things at all, which I'm not sure is totally true. So, yeah, it's a big and sensitive question because I suspect quite a lot of people here today are very turned on by biomimicry and biophilic design. And there's some incredibly brilliant people doing it, and I respect and um, love their work. I just think that since we're right, you know, we've reached a sort of pretty crunch point in many ways. Now is the point to say, do we need to make, is, you know, do we have a right to make things just because we're called a designer? I, I don't see that it's a right. Maybe things need to be made, but that's not the same thing as what can I do as a designer to make this place healthier? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I should just say thank you to everybody for all these questions that have been coming through. It's um, we have we have some more if that's OK, John. Yeah. Um, so um, we have um, are any cities intentionally promoting care networks in their urban ecosystems? Uh, that's a good question. So th the answer is a bit. So what's happening is that a lot of cities, it's a very good question because I think there's a tremendous potential for all of us to be part of making them if they don't exist yet. There are cities like Bologna or Montreal where social care is a kind of rather advanced stage of being cooperative and co kind of distributed and peer to peer uniquely in the world. That is not the same as a caring for nature or caring for other things, but it's bubbling under and scattered around. I'll put it that way. So lots of cities are saying we the sharing city phenomenon is um, fairly widespread. The biophilic city, that's we need more nature. But for the most part, it's kind of a it's it's a kind of concept where city managers and the designers and the investors say this would be cool. We need some nature who can bring me nature. Uh, and then they kind of plant or they say we're going to plant a million trees or we're going to make a million parks or something, which is kind of good. But they don't tend to think about the the care of these investments through time. That's I'll put it that way. So that's a pretty it's a great question because I think that how you look after uh, you, you bring nature or you bring care into your society, then what happens that then what happens is not sufficiently attended to. And that's where you get into this notion of platforms and infrastructures that enable people to do things through time. I mean, camp trees are a good example. So lots of people are saying we're going to have plant a million trees in our city and they will quickly either die or become, you know, a public nuisance or all sorts of things go wrong unless you have an arborism service that will look after the trees. And they say, what's an arborism service? And then you discover that there are people who know about tree care they need equipment, they need all sorts of things which don't exist and that somebody has to provide. So that's the kind of we're entering into that kind of care platform world. Um, but the good thing is that once you if, you if you see it as just something that somebody has to pay for, like paying for somebody to run your prisons or paying for somebody to run the buses, if you think of care as a collaboration between experts and the citizens, it's a much healthier uh, picture because then people can look after, help to look after their trees or their neighbours, but have professional people doing it at the same time. So the pro-am care, I think, is where the, the great futures lie. It's, of course, going to be complicated to organise, but I, I think that's where if we participate in these things rather than just pay for them in our taxes, it'll be more, it'll be more resilient. Great, yeah. Um, and we have, I think we'll round off with with one last question um, and I'm going to combine a few questions together um, to think about our students uh, at Leeds Beckett and um, thinking about how we can design with nature first and what could our students do to make a difference? Well, I think it's a great question because I would be surprised if I had given you a clear answer to that picture in my talk. I think the simplest thing I can say is don't go into a darkened room and think very hard about how to answer that question. Rather, go and find some person or group of people that are doing an activity that has something to do with nature 
and have a conversation about whether your design skills could be useful. It could be an urban garden, it could be a health center, it could be maybe somebody is planting trees, maybe somebody is cleaning up the river. Anything to do with food is good because food is life, you know, it's feeding the soil. If there are people doing food waste projects, there's always an opportunity to change the, the metabolism of food in the city or in a, in a place. So that's all right. I hope I'm answering clearly. Go and find people who are doing things, who have knowledge very different from yours and say, look, I'm a designer. I can do, these are the kind of things I can do. Would that be helpful? I think that nine times out of 10, they will say, yes, that would be great. And then one time out of 10, they might have some money to pay you, but that's, you know, one thing at a time. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, I haven't read out all the, there's been lots of compliments as well that are coming through just saying thank you so much for such a brilliant and inspiring talk. Um, so lots of those coming through as well. So um, I'll round off uh, the Q&As now and just say thank you to John uh, for answering all of our questions. And um, I will hand over to Simon. <laughs> Thank you very much and uh, thank you John for a really fascinating talk. Um, there, there's an artist called Raphael Perez Evans who is exhibiting right now at the Henry Moore Institute in Leeds and his exhibition is called Handful and he noticed that birds only take a handful of seeds each day, just what they need. His question was why can't humans do the same, only take what they need. Um, uh, your talk showed us today how we can all make a difference and a multiplicity of ways we can get entangled in the sustainability of our planet. It was really wonderful, John, and really enriching and, and, and really gave us a, a, a lot of ways we can actually get involved ourselves. So thank you. And thank you, Lauren, um, for conducting the Q&A and introducing John. And thank you to our audience. Thank you so much uh, for coming today. Um, have a great evening, everyone. Goodbye from us.